probably next to my guest coming up right here, probably some of the most suppressed people right there on YouTube. All right, y'all. I know everybody's looking forward to this part too, and I'm not going to fool around. I'm going to get right into it. How you doing, Nathan? Absolutely phenomenal. How are you doing tonight? Man, I'm doing good. It's a day the Lord hath made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it, as I know you are, my man. You got it. All right. So, um, yeah, naturally, everybody's, I mean, good night, man. I, Nathan, I'll be honest with you, bro. <laughs> Knowing what I know about your story, bro, I know that we could probably do five episodes and not even get into the permaculture. So we're going to have to have you back again for all the questions that are going to likely come up. And we're going to get into your permaculture journey, but it's made and I will rejoice and be glad in it as I know you are, my man. You got it. All right. So, um, yeah, naturally, everybody's, I mean, good night, man. I, Nathan, I'll be honest with you, bro. <laughs> Knowing what I know about your story, bro, I know that we could probably do five episodes and not even get into the permaculture. So we're going to have to have you back again for all the questions that are going to likely come up. And we're going to get into your permaculture journey. But right now, there's a lot of big things going on in terms of um, things that you might have exclusive knowledge about. And we're just going to kind of get your... Right off the bat, we're going to kind of get your take on one story that's just kind of come up recently, and that is, and this is from the New York Post, and everybody else is reporting it now, although the mainstream prostitutes seem to be not covering this story, and that's basically 170 people with Epstein links um, are likely to be named in the court document set to be released in a couple of weeks. Now, what they're saying is that in the beginning of January is that 170 people that are on this Epstein list are going to be revealed. Do you think that's going to amount to anybody of any consequence? You know, I think that's a brilliant question. It's without question, there'll be some people that'll pop up on there that are going to amount to quite substantive players in the world, whether it's in the intelligence community or in the financial capital side of the world. He had very many tendrils when it came to all of the different avenues of people that had been compromised through a lot of his strategic intelligence gathering operations. And what I'm talking about is a lot of honeypot operations where mm -hmm. the guy was bringing people in to sexually compromise them and document it so it could be used as evidence of blackmail against them. This is something I grew up in a culture where this was the normative practice and the, the means with which power and access was granted to other individuals. And so even as that those kind of findings come forward, I think what will be more interesting is to see whether or not there's any actual further movement on any of those names or those individuals, further investigations, because more often than not, what I've seen consistently is a suppression of certain information that would actually make it paramount to bringing this forth, whether that's his address book and his little black book, which has been in the hands of the FBI now for a good long while, and we're not seeing any of that type of information brought forward either. So I always hold hope that there will come a day where there's actual justice and people's people are truly awakened to the depravity of our criminal justice system on one side of the equation and the facilitation of pedophilia and rampant horrific abuse of children as a means of power for those who rule over us. Well, going all the way back to the Franklin scandal, as I recall, it happened under the first Bush administration. And the information that came out from that was absolutely positively dreadful. And we saw that it, it doesn't matter. It's not a blue state. It's not a red state. It's a state against you. And these people, it seems, their political alliances and allegiance all fall apart when it comes to this sexual depravity we're talking about here. No justice, none, ever came out of the Franklin scandal. And it wouldn't shock me, none, that the list that they come up with, the 170 people that it's probably going to be as butlers, probably some flight attendants, maybe a pilot or two. And then, of course, they're going to throw in a couple of names. And then at the end of the day, if it's like everything else, like you said, the FBI has had this guy, had the goods on this guy forever and a day. Nothing's ever happened. And, um, man, I'm hoping and praying that something does happen, that finally this damn breaks. But it's, um, you know, I, I got I got no reason to believe that we're going to see any improvement in any of this. So no, um, go ahead, bud. You said it absolutely perfectly. You know, I've I've seen the status quo of this agenda go on for decades. The Rodney King case, who you're talking about, and the the banking scandal is really all that 
that formatively ever came to the surface was that $40 million had been embezzled through his banking institute. But what happened when they broke open that, for those of you who are unfamiliar, he was one of the singers at the, the Republican National Convention, somebody who was very well connected in the political world on the Republican side of the committee at the time. Yes. And he was found to be trafficking children from a Catholic run boys institution that was called Boys Town in, in Omaha, Nebraska. And when the children that were coming forward talking about how they were being used for these sexual favors by politicians and by people in Washington, D.C., being flown from Omaha directly in to the White House at times yes. and having videotaped interactions sodomized on tape and then being flown back. Okay, these I'm talking about children here. This is in some kind of like normal traditional form of a prostitution ring. This is a child exploitation ring that was running out of the United States White House at the time. And then over the course of the investigation, what they ended up doing with the victims who came forward was turning around and prosecuting the victims who came forward. None of the perpetrators, none of the perpetrators were fully prosecuted at all whatsoever. And so where I come from in the world of being a, on the victim side of those equations, these are always those lessons that they throw in your face to condition you to learned helplessness. That if you come forward and you talk about this, you come forward and you try to get justice brought against you. In fact, you get the opposite. The victims are the ones who more often than not are the ones who are per who are prosecuted and persecuted. Now I got to ask you, because I've been saying this for a while. Um, let me go on back a little bit. When Bradley Manning first came out and dropped what he did, you know, you know what happened to him. You got Snowden. You got Jay Kirk Weeby. You know, a whole long list of people that came out at the NSA. Uh, Bill Benny, a long list of there's at least four of them that I could probably name from the top of my head that were much higher in the higher echelons of um, the NSA that came out, told everything what happened to him. Every one of them were dogged. We know about Snowden, of course. He got away over to Russia, which these days seems like he probably made the better choice. And then, of course, you have Julian Assange. Yeah. Nathan, I got to know because I view you in that same category as some of these other whistleblowers. Every single time. In fact, I had actually told my wife when it was when the news first came out about Snowden, I said, you know what? Sadly, I mean, I didn't have the best opinion of things. And frankly, if I'm totally honest, I'm not sure that it's improved any. But I've always wondered why on earth a person as intelligent as yourself and as intelligent as Julian Assange or or some of these other people, uh, the other guy, um, William Benny, was probably number two at the NSA. All of them absolutely destroyed their lives. And then, of course, what's happened to you? I got to know. Knowing that in every single case, when a whistleblower comes forward, they get their heads chopped off. And I mean that figuratively, but sometimes literally. Why would you do that? Why, why have you decided to do this knowing full well the full force of what is likely to come down on you? It's a great question. At the end of the day, I have an intolerance to compromise. I cannot stand when I find compromise within people. At the end of the day, I know it's something that's going to, I'm going to find inevitably. But when I work for an institution, when I work for anybody, I want to find out their why. Fundamentally, the very earliest formative years of my life, I became very, very adept at lurking into people's secrets, finding out why they did what they did, a motivation hunter. I wanted to know what made every person tick because I'd been traumatized in such an extent early on that I knew that there was an ulterior agenda. I didn't have a, a natural formed vision of man as good. I understood that there was a duplicity behind most people. There was a hypocrisy hiding there. And it was my job, my mission to find it out and root it out and then bring it out. That was always fundamentally what gave me a will to survive, a will to live and a will to fight was that I wanted to see injustice brought to the light so that justice could be performed. Now, I was trapped within the system at the time where I wasn't able to execute any of my own free will within that. However, when I got out into the world and I began to see how much compromise was in various organizations that I was working for, whether it was mental health centers that I worked for or whether it was in the United States military, as I began to see how rotten and corrupt so many of these institutions were, it galvanized in me a need to be different a need to be set apart from that and and you know let me tell you you sit there and you study whistleblowers and it does it it shakes you 
it shakes you because you understand that the, the reason they're per, they're prosecuting these people under the very acts from 1917s, the treason act stuff they established during World War One. They're drawing out all kinds of legislation to try to go after these people saying that they're committing treason. Same with like counter court corporate espionage is a whole other arena. I did security consulting for groups that were in the tech industry and ca- counter espionage is a huge industry. And you, you have the same types of mechanisms being deployed against people that are coming out with secrets from inside corporate activities that are major, e- major evils, horrible moral and ethical bre- breaches that are taking place. But I always saw, even as though they were villainized, even as they were prosecuted, persecuted, some of them hunted down and eradicated, tortured, To me, at the end of the day, you must understand something. I have suffered so much in my life already. I have suffered an intolerable amount of abuse and trauma and learned helplessness. And at the end of the day, what I realized is that no matter what I've suffered in the past, none of it could be compared to what I do with the choices that I make today because I'm trying to leave a legacy for my family and for every other survivor that is out there today that we need to be bold and courageous even in the face of insurmountable odds and assured death, not just death of like, you know, our bodies physically dying. That's the easy part. The hard part is watching our peer group break apart, is watching the people, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues turn with uh, with us hatred in their eyes with like a malevolent look in their eyes, like a branding you as insane or crazy. All these tactics that start to get weaponized in the courts of public opinion. I understood at the end of the day, it was more important for me to give up my life for the sake of the good fruit that I could sow by speaking the truth. The truth is always forever indefeatable. And that at the end of the day is what I aligned myself to. When I read the word in the scripture, that is where I found my new identity. That was where I found my new purpose. And I saw men and women in there who did not compromise. And because of that, they turned the world upside down. They overturned kingdoms. Like they literally were persecuted and sought after in the four corners of the earth. Like I wrote a blog post recently that's called Fighting the Fear. And I address exactly what you're talking about here because every man and woman is going to face these decisions. You may not be the whistleblower that's dealing with the living in the deep underground military base in Hawaii like Edward Snowden was. But you know what? You have an access to information at different points in your life that gives you the opportunity to bring to light evil that's being done around you. And now that is your opportunity where you're truly tested. And every one of us is going to be held accountable for what we did with what we were entrusted with. I had been entrusted with a lot of people's secrets. I have seen and witnessed so many people's most shameful moments. And I had to choose whether or not I went along with the agenda to have an easier life, a more comfortable life. Or was I willing to take the narrow road out and trust that my creator and that the Messiah could guard me and shelter me and protect me? And at the end of the day, if we do perish for the secrets that we've told, let it be for this, that we spoke the truth, that we laid our life down for the love of our neighbors, for the love of our brothers and our sisters, so that every other victim and survivor and person who's been prosecuted and controlled for so long in their life know that they themselves need to stand up and they can maybe stomp a few of us out. They can stomp a good many of us out, but sooner or later there is this turning of the tide that takes place when martyrdom happens and people will stand upon the blood of their brothers and sisters and they will resist and they will cast off tyrants. You know, a guy with a lot of sense would said, um, it's well and good for those to die for what they believe, but what cause is not better served by living? And I've thought about that a number of times, you know, um, yes, martyrdom, I guess, you know, that would qualify, <laughs> certainly, but and unless you're going to wind up being the martyr, and I guess it also depends on how well your spirit, how well your soul is prepared for such things. And by and large, I just don't see, I mean, the bravery that you've demonstrated and people like you, I've always wondered, because I've never had the opportunity to ask anybody, because in fact, you are a whistleblower, and you've suffered greatly as a matter of it. I just wonder. Let me say it another way. Have you had any regrets having done it? Hmm. I'd say I have this. The main regret I have is not staying inside to gather more evidence. You know, looking back on how I handled the situation and how how I could have gone about it, maybe trying to. And this is easy, a lot easier to say this now than where I was. It was a lot. It was a lot scarier at the very beginning. But as time went on, you know, I realized I wish I could have stayed in a little bit more to try to 
bleed them from within. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. There's just this, there's a saboteur inside me that wants to just nick some arteries before he leaves. And I didn't get a real opportunity to kind of have my final strike from within that I really had always wanted and wanted, wanted more than anything else. You know, there's a deep desire for vengeance that permeated my soul for so long. And I wanted to have an opportunity to, to blast it everywhere on just how these people were. And so on one side, that's a, that's an area of regret. But on the other side, I don't regret anything whatsoever because my life has been filled with, with peace, like with actual peace. Like I, I did not sleep soundly for decades of my life. I used everything I could find to try to push an off button to make the nightmares go away, to make the regret and the despair and the depression and the anxiety and the, the imminent feeling of dread that was on me. I just wanted all of that stuff. I wanted to numb myself to the world for so long. And I was on a quest for death. And so at the end of the day, for the last seven years, what I've had instead is a quest for life. Like I'm truly learning to love living. Just like you said, I, I found that in by the sweat of my face in a greenhouse, being satisfied by eating the food that I got to help cultivate. I found I would have never found that if I'd always taken the wealthy route and had somebody else make my food for me for the rest of my life, I would have never experienced what it's like to sacrifice my life for my family's well-being in a totally different way. Like this is, these are the gifts that men have. Men need to work hard. Men need to do difficult things. It's, it's innate in our design. When we don't do that, when we abdicate and we avoid hard things, we become softies and we become so easy to control and to compromise. And instead, if you make a man resistant, resilient, tempered, hardened, and capable, they are absolutely some of the most powerful people the most formidable enemies you could ever hope to contend against. And over these last seven years, if anything, that by making that choice, I have been galvanized in my mission and my resolve to persevere and to see this through to the end, because this is what I was made for. Now we're going to get into the permaculture folks. I know we said we'd do that, but I got to cover up some loose ends because I know some people are asking questions. Um, no, we'll we'll definitely get there, but I got to hit you up in one other thing. Now, folks, keep in mind this is gonna this interview is being it's basically happening a week before you're actually hearing it. Okay, so um, so what is what is today the nineteenth? Okay, we're coming up real close, real close to the uh, solstice. Now, I've only read. The, I mean, I don't have any up close personal understanding of this. What I do know about it has been told to me like people like Russ Dizdar, um, you know, so many other people. I mean, not directly. I mean, just from studying his work. Uh, Russ Dizdar, um, oh, shoot, I could probably think of a whole handful of if I really put it, if I really thought about it. But the point of it being is that, as I understand it, this is a high day for a lot of the people that are affiliated with uh, what you were once part of. Do you have any thoughts on that and other so-called, let's say, holidays. I mean, I live just north of Asheville, about 45 minutes, bro. And this is like the Wicca capital of the world, I'm told. And um, you can feel it. Every time you go to town, you can absolutely, positively, unless I'm prayed up, unless I put on that full armor, bro, I am definitely not. I go there one person and I leave somebody else. Just I, I got to go there tomorrow. And if I don't have on that full armor, bro, I'm going to come back a different guy. And it's, I can feel it. My wife can feel it the whole nine yards. But anyway, we're coming up on this solstice. And um, what does that, what does that mean to all the people out there? Something of a rhetorical question, but I want you to answer that for all the people that don't know. What is that? What's the significance of the solstice with these people that are mixed up in this sort of thing? You bet, man. Just on a total comparison there, when I lived outside of Asheville, I remember feeling that that depravity, that darkness, mm -hmm. especially as it was building towards Halloween. Anytime we got to these specific high days, please understand, there is a physical and spiritual supercharging of the kingdom of darkness. And they, there are practitioners who that's all they do. That is their full-time job as diligent and hard working of any person you've ever known they work to open doors to demonic activity they work they work hard fasting cutting themselves 
extend like causing harm to themselves and to others in order to open up these rifts between these realms. So when you're looking at things like the solstices coming up, whether it's the winter solstice, the summer solstice is another one. There is a, a very massive undertaking because this is when the season of the, the sun God is dying. This is a season of death by and far and so much of what people experience during the season the highest instances of suicide at almost any other time of the year is right now this is literally a season when that mm. occult revelry revelry is at its highest and so much of what goes into like literally today today is a massive preparation day tomorrow is even more so because what they're doing is there's a a specific types each cult has different ways of doing these things i'm going to share a little bit more from my experiences i grew up in flagstaff arizona and there on top of the mountain is where a lot of people will gather and worship the heavenly host they will go up onto the tops of the peaks on the winter solstice this is they believe that these angels these fallen angels these deities will come and descend upon that mountain and they bring their daughters out they bring their children out onto the mountain at night under the cover of darkness and under the light of the stars and they will engage in two things on one side of it there will be mating rituals there's going to be death rituals and so there's always this mixture between those two realms that they will be enacting on that place this is because a lot of people this is the mountains outside of uh, Flagstaff, Arizona are these volcanic peaks or 12, 13,000 foot volcanic peaks that are out there. And they believe they've always been these sacred mountains, especially like the Hopi Indians. And they believe these Kachinas, that's what they call them. Mm -hmm. These like angels that would come down these, these, deities and they would give them join them to their daughters and they would stay and abide on those mountains for six months until the summer solstice and then they would travel away to a different place but during that time is when a lot of children are brought forth like literally they will induce women to give birth during the that time and children will be sacrificed animals will be sacrificed people will be tortured and abused during that time in order to cement this covenant a blood covenant with these beings during that time that is when those beings and their priests like a uh, best way to understand a priest is like a mediator they will be channeling these spirits autonomic writing will be taking place they will be getting their dictations their 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 written orders, their commands. It is a very critical time. It's almost like if you think about it, it's like their commanders for their army are in the field. And this is their time when they have their sit downs and they have their get togethers and they get their download on what they need to do, plans and tactics and strategies on how to make moves in the earthly realm from the spirit realm. And so that's why there's this need for dark power, dark energies, dark neuroscience in order to open those gates and begin the communing with the dead. So if people that are outside of that, please understand something. If you're somebody who does not ever physically see these things, does not ever personally witness these things, when you're feeling that oppression, that heaviness in your spirit, that sickening headaches, pressure in your guts, like that just uncomfortability. You're experiencing the realm of the demonic. It is it is another world. It's another realm, and it makes us physically sick. It's a dark, disgusting experience to be around it. And when you're driving around areas where these events have taken place, these gates and these doorways where that blood was shed, even if it's cleaned up, is going to leave a mark. It's going to leave a tendril that sticks to you and that's why even as you're coming out of Asheville and stuff like that cleansing yourself and asking the father to help just forgive the sins that are empowering this kingdom of darkness forgive the sins that are empowering these evil spirits to be sent on assignment because from there there's an unleashing of those spirits to target specific people specific ministry specific areas of resistance that those people have and this is a season when if you watch carefully between now and the beginning of next year you will watch so many people suffer horrific calamities car accidents suicides sudden deaths unbelievable sicknesses you will watch if you pay attention between now and the next two weeks you will see these events take place and that's because people that have doors open to the enemy they have legal grounds for these spirits to come in and start destroying people's lives so this is why it's critical that people become armed with an understanding of how to contend against these spiritual warfare you need to, you need to know what it means to arm up and you also need to know what it means to shut down the doors that the enemy's opening up to your life because so many of these holidays people are experiencing 
hunting mm-hmm. are rooted in these practices. They were illegal in our country for a long time for a reason because this is what they are. This is their origin story. This is what they were used to do. These pagan cults use these times and these seasons for their festivals. So it's critical to identify and learn the origins of these things so you can set your family apart from them. I got to know, um, man, I, I know we got to get onto the permaculture thing, but I got to ask you something because about a year ago, I was out in Safford, Arizona, which is at the base of Mount Graham, where the Vatican has their um, their telescope, their uh, Lucifer telescope. And um, according to the native people around there, I even did a video of it a while back, and it kind of freaked out a lot of people when I told them, you know, if you read any of the work of uh, the late Tom Horn and Chris Putnam, Uh, Exo Vaticana is a book they wrote, and they also wrote uh, one regarding the popes. And anyway, I had a very, very, uh, Nathan, this was bizarre. Um, Mm. I was out there working on this earth ship in Safford, had no idea. Um, My wife had told me right before I went, hey, you know you're going to be near Mount Graham? From the map, I'm like, okay, well, hey, it's right around the corner, man. I wonder if I can go right up that thing. Well, I couldn't. They had it blocked off. But what they did have, and strangely enough, it was like once a month, and this Earthship build was going to be for about a month. Man, I'm going to struggle to try to condense this story. But in a nutshell, at the base, I I was online, and it just so happened on that Saturday or Sunday, I don't recall which, I want to say it was a Saturday, they were actually at the base of Mount Graham. They actually had this observatory set up, and... They were like, hey, we're open to the public. We're going to do the A, B, C, and D. I'm like, okay, well, there was one guy I knew for sure that was working on that Earthship build that I knew was wide awake. And I said, hey, I'm going to go to this thing later on. Why don't you come over there with me? He says, well, I'm riding with these other folks. I'll just bring them with me. So I get over there and I text him. And I'm like, hey, man, they got free food here. So I know they're coming now because everybody working on an Earthship is usually pretty doggone broke. So they get over there and... We sit through a little bit of what they have, like a they have a little uh, welcome center. And I told them, hey, my name is Billy. I got a YouTube channel. I'll, you know, I'd like to document some of this. They're like, yeah, cool. Get in there, listen to the presentation, all of which to me was hogwash. Is, well, I won't even get into what that was all about. But when it was all said and done, a very strange thing happened. They're like, okay, let's go outside. We got some telescopes set up. We're going to go look at these things. We're looking at them. Nothing strange happened there until... I go back in and the curator of this museum, which just happened to be there at this welcome center, um, is there and they're saying, Hey, um, you want to interview so-and-so I'm like, yeah, I'd love to check him out. So then all of a sudden everything was cool, Nathan, all the way up until the point where I said, and I quote, Hey, um, what are your thoughts about this book called exo Vata? I got about that far exo Vata. And the guy was like, and then you could see a sudden hush come over the entire group. What I didn't know is I'm asking this question to not only the curator, but apparently the guy who was the number one, he had just retired and he was the number one person running all those telescopes on the top of Mount Graham. And so, like I said, there was a sudden hush that came over him. Next thing I know, they're taking me into this very, it was like an off limits kind of place in this museum. It was very bizarre, very odd. It was I tried to recount the story before, and if if I'm not careful, I, if this thing could go on for 20 minutes. But some very bizarre things unfolded there. And um, it was like they were trying to get me alone. And I'm like, dude, this is starting to get creepy. The hairs on my back and my neck are standing up. And, hey, bro, if anybody knows anything about me, I'm always armed, uh, one way or another. So don't start no SH and there won't be no IT is my motto. So that's how it was going to go down. Long story short, I got out of there. And all of a sudden, this event that was supposed to go till 9 p.m., it was only 7 o'clock at that point. They shut it all down. Said, all right, that's it. We're going to the house. Everybody pack it up, move it out. And then we were on our way. And then, okay, fast forward to a little bit. We're we're going to this place where it was like a uh, bar and grill to go eat. Asked the same question. Happened to be some native people in there. And good night, man. They were just starting to open up and then all of a sudden something shut them down. But anyway, long story, what I'm, what I'm trying to get into and what I'm asking is why these mountains, it's like of all the mountains they could have put, they could have put that observatory on every, any mountain you could imagine, 
But they chose Mount Graham, which just happens to be one of the, as I understand it, one of the five most sacred mountains on planet Earth to all Native people is Mount Graham. The Vatican came in there, kicked them out, teamed up with ASU. I mean, the story goes a lot of different ways. But the point being, why these mountains? Why do they do these things on these mountains? Is there any significance? I mean, I'm reminded of the Book of Enoch, where these watcher angels yeah. came down on Mount Hermon. I mean, what am I missing here? I mean, maybe you could fill in the gaps here. Man, what a wild experience that you were actually there at Mount Graham, too, to even get access to that area at all. I read the book Exo Vaticanus years ago when he first came out. And you know what? There, there is a, there is a cover story to why there's the obsession with observatories that people are fed on a regular basis, but people have been fed a very contradictory experience to what these celestial stars and these, these things are over our heads, because you must understand the scripture is pretty clear that these wandering stars also get imprisoned at times. These things are, there are celestial beings up there that they are absolutely communicating with. You know, there's, the, the Mount Graham is one of those very sacred mountains, the one that's over Flagstaff as well. I always called it Mount Prescott all my life growing up. But that that one also has the very p observatory where they discovered Pluto at. This is one of the preeminent observatories in the United States is also located there in Flagstaff, Arizona. And the United States Navy, wouldn't you know it, has one of their most expensive observatories. It's called the United States Naval precision optical interferometer and that is set up there just outside of flagstaff arizona as well and it has these um astronomical interferometers they're like arms that that lay out they're like 250 or 260 meter long arms that extend out in three different directions like a big y shape and what they can do is they can move along these very accurate and fixed points over the course of it and aim lasers and i mean very technical different types of optical devices up into the sky you're we're talking broadcasting out as well as observing and recalling stuff that's coming down in this is one of the most expensive navy research projects that's in the united states and it's also right up there so on one side of it let me just put it there's a scientific aspect to the high mountains having dry air and being better for clarity on being able to see longer distances on the other side of the equation is this is what you read about from antiquity people go up onto the high places to commune with celestial beings things that are in the, the heavens above us they can communicate with you you must learn how to decode and decipher their language and you can learn how to communicate back with them that is the preeminent goal of a lot of these observatories on what they're there doing just why same thing that's taking place there in hawaii and why the observatory Observatories that are set up over there as well. You will find massive military infrastructure. You will find Vatican, the Roman Catholic Church, is the predominant purchaser and procurer of these ob observatories around the world. They are trying to talk to these beings. They communicate with them because this is what they've been doing for a long time. These are, these are where the principalities, these thrones, these these rulers in the spiritual wickedness in high places, this is where a lot of them physiologically, like in space and time, actually are. And you can talk to them and communicate with them. One of those ways is the dark sciences, like I was describing before, where people are engaging in these rituals to talk to them. A lot of that type of magic that's done is to summon stuff up from underneath our feet. Then there's those that turn towards the sun and the moon and the stars, people that worship in the groves and people that worship like an astral and these where they're laying themselves out before the moon and the sun these people are doing that type of magic and i believe it's the exact same thing it's what's taking place at these observatories it's just a much more psych scientific approach with which to try to do it but this is why they get the funding like they have similar to on the underground side of it would be all of the particle accelerators and all, i mean there's tens of thousands of these things there's not just the one in cern there's tens of thousands of these things these are means with which there's communication devices there's rifts being opened up among many different services functions that these service they are using these to open up the gates into these underworlds to commune with these spirits and i know for a lot of people that's a huge stretch but you must understand that is why it is financed the way it is that is why the projects the human the humanitarian side of life is not where financing goes it goes towards these dark sciences for a reason bro you got the hairs on the back of my neck standing up right now and here's the reason why I told you we went to a bar and grill one time. We were doing karaoke in this place, and 
eating lunch and the whole nine yards. And I kid you not, I don't know how you just brought this up, but one of the things I was told is that they thought, I don't know how I couldn't, I was trying to tease it out of these people, but I'm in the company of other people that have no idea what I'm even asking these locals. And they brought up, they didn't describe it as a CERN facility, but they said a particle accelerator that was underneath Mount Graham. Yep. And I'm like, hold on. So you got the world's most powerful binocular telescope, which they affectionately call uh, Lucifer or Lucy, rather, according to uh, Tom Horn, which, by the way, the, yep. uh, the curator of that museum came down like a ton of bricks. He said, oh, that guy's a liar. You know, I'm the one that brought him up to the mountain the whole nine yards. And I'm like, OK, yeah. So was he a liar also in uh, Petros Romanus when he predicted when the pope was going to step down? So, um, yeah, so I started firing back at this guy. <laughs> but the point being is that all these people, these locals that were there knew about some sort of particle accelerator. And I'm like, until you just said that now you're selling you're telling me it sounds like that they're opening up dimensions above, I guess, as above, so below. Um, and they're saying the particle accelerator was underneath Mount Graham. And the crazy thing was, is that the natives were like, man, there's so many other mountains around here. They could have messed around on, I mean, roughly 10,000 feet is what they need. There's other mountains that are more suited and easier access than Mount Graham. But that was like a holy place for all these native tribes. And then they mentioned something about, it was funny because there were some strange formations beneath, man, Nathan, you got me, um, Wow, man, you got me a little fired up here because I never even thought until you said that I had no idea that they would even have a particle accelerator because the only one that anybody really talks about is CERN. And I've heard from other sources that they got multiple ones, some that are possibly even more powerful, some that don't require near the infrastructure as CERN and um, or, you know, near the footprint rather. And uh, supposedly there's one right under Mount Graham. So what are the odds of that? Bro, you're blowing my mind. There, there is. Listen, t for those of you that have not, um, oh man, what is his name? I just lost it. Anthony Patch. Gosh, yes, yeah. Yeah. man, Anthony Patch. Okay, now this is all like at the time Pat at Exo Vaticanus. I was studying all this stuff, right? Nicholson, 1968. Anthony Patch. These were two like forerunners for a lot of some of the stuff we're talking about here but anthony patch in particular studied and covered so much of what the particle accelerators in so many ways are being used they're interdimensional doorways now not listen there's lots of different kinds there's cyclotrons or cyclotrons there's all kinds of them and please understand something these have been around since the 1930s okay that's a strange paradigm shift for a lot of people what well, you're thinking great depression particle accelerators are a reality in our country here in the united states so this stuff has been around for a long time please understand on another side of what particle accelerators one of the key components that they're used for is creating meta materials materials that do not exist in a natural occurring state or environment and i'm talking about a production side of it not just small tiny like single particle size amounts i'm talking about Amounts that you can use as if you are mining a material. This is what some of these things exclusively are done and utilized to do, similar to the nuclear reactors and some of the materials that you can get, whether it's plutonium, whether it's neptunium, which is an even more useful one, which is a superconductor in the underworld, in the like deep underground military bases. There are the technology that they utilize in a lot of the vehicles and a lot of the transportation methodology is something called neptunium, which is a superconductor, meaning you don't have to cool it down. Down to almost absolute zero in order for it to be able to float and levitate other objects like uh, traditional superconductors. It's as that way as it is. So you're able to build entire craft out of it seamlessly. So no circuit boards required, no electronics required. The entire craft itself becomes the circuit board. That is one of those meta materials that's used in the underworld in a very prolific way. Well, they, the material scientists that work on these projects, they work in these particle accelerator laboratories, and they also work in these nuclear reactor facilities. This is what so much of our continuity of government, which is what the United States began to really implement during the cold war in order that they would have a way of carrying on in the event of nuclear strike from the soviet union or in the event of uh, i mean absolute doomsday right where all the nukes fall and everybody on the surface is turned to glass so let's all go down into our little bunkers but in the meantime there's literally an, an ongoing perpetual running government cities 
cities of people like in South Dakota. Um, there's, there's a, I can't remember the name of it right now. One of the very famous research facilities that's, that's hundreds of hundreds of people and thousands of people work underneath the ground just up there in that town in South Dakota at, at the, one of their particle accelerators. They take over a lot of previously abandoned mines and will start to put in all these scientific instruments for those, for these purposes. And they literally, people live their entire lives down underneath the surface of the earth, never knowing or experiencing the type of life that you and I take as granted. And what it does is it fosters compartmentalization during the world war ii we had a sit we had five hundred thousand people working on the manhattan project five hundred thousand people 10 knew what it was truly for 10 people this is the type of truly compartmentalized information secret keeping that the united states government and military has been proficient at for decades and because of that in the secret scientists like in the world i talked about the jason projects with with sgt report before but this is where these scientific consultory groups this is where their intelligentsia goes they really do recruit and capture scientists and take them underground people that have breakthrough technologies what they would be called like the guys that I got brought in to do security for in, in uh, outside of Boulder, Colorado, they had something that was deemed by Los Alamos as a highly disruptive te- piece of technology because it was a storage drive that could store a thousandfold what current technology could do. It was very, very dangerous for those guys to have that technology. There's a lot of people who don't want that information getting out, that type of tool to go to the masses because it ruins industries. It overnight topples industries. Mm -hmm. And so at times what happens is people come forward. They were in the, 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 financing phase. They were trying to raise capital. Well, the people that come forward, whether it's venture capitalists or capital I investors, all the different forms, military, there was all kinds of people from the artificial intelligence community. All these people start coming in and courting them, right? But then there's this secondary group that comes in and they are offering them not money. They're offering them access to that underworld. They're offering them access to what you would call like a a black box team. You're going to disappear You and your entire team are going to disappear for two years. You're never going to be allowed to talk about what you did. You're never going to be allowed to tell anybody what happened. And on the other side of it, you're going to go through a whole lot of, let me just put it straight, like mind control to shut you down to remembering whatever took place down there. And then you're going to resurface. And really, this is where so much of our infrastructure has really gone. So much of the real wealth of our country, like they'll they'll kick it off every so often and be like, hey, the Pentagon, we're missing a trillion dollars. They're like, shucks. Sorry about that. You know, we might have a tragedy strike the next day to eliminate all the evidence about where that may have gone. Very convenient truth, an inconvenient truth, y'all. It's a reality of what this is how the world truly runs, because you must understand there really is an inverse pyramid below your feet, and it really goes down to Tartarus. That is where these fallen angels, like you mentioned before, described in the book of Enoch, described in Second Peter, described in the book of Jude, described by cultures all across the world that came down, these celestial beings, do you want to call them extra dimensional entities? These beings came down and they exchanged genetic material with mankind for information, for technology. And when they, this is what they trade with people. This is their currency, the secrets of heaven. When they do these exchanges, they have a tyrannical consumption of life. They require flesh. They require blood because they are not flesh and blood like you and I. They are flesh and bone. So they require, once they're cut off from the most high, they require a fuel source. They must recharge. Okay, They have to have power. That power comes through life. It literally says in the garden that the serpent was cursed. The dragon was cursed to eat dust. For the rest of its life. And then he turns to Adam and says, from dust you were created and to dust you will return. They literally consume the dust of mankind because we have become their food source for them. This is why these cannibalistic, these these cults have been around to facilitate the acquisition of human material in order to facilitate the feeding of that underworld. It's a real place, real entities that live there, and they work with mankind in order to achieve their will on the surface. This is why it's like a prison colony that we have to do our absolute utmost to break free from. Good night, man. Boy, I could go on with you all night long because this is exactly the kind of stuff... um, I know about to a certain extent, obviously, you know, quite a deal, a great deal more. 
And frankly, a lot of folks out there in the audience, they were asking that I would do more episodes of stuff like this because I, for in so many different ways, I think it's, I know for sure it's out there. Like I'll give you a, Nathan, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you something that I've never said before on, on radio before. Um, two things actually. One, I worked with this guy. He wrote two books on the civil war and I was helping him out one day. I was working with him. It was in small town, Kansas, former air force guy worked at one of those deep underground military bases. And I caught him on the right day. And he told me about his buddy who had seen a chimera of a legit centaur. I mean, like it freaked him out so bad. And it was working at one of these dumbs for those that don't know a deep underground military base. And uh, this is years. I'm, I'm talking like 15, probably 15 years ago. And he told me about this and how it basically drove this guy insane. Now, let me fast forward. Now, Hollywood, you know, I could go in, so many different ways about how there's they kind of let you know what they're going to do before they do it. Now check this out. I want you to go to look it out for yourself and tell me if I'm crazy because to my knowledge, I tried to get out. I wasn't doing radio at the time when I first discovered this. And to my knowledge, I don't know that anybody else ever, ever has. If you watch, I've always been a sucker for these superhero movies. So if you watch the first Avengers and I think it's within five minutes of the opening of when the thing starts up, they're in a deep underground military base. They got this thing they call the Tesseract. And then if you look behind it, it is an exact cutaway of CERN. Okay. And then they fire this thing up or it fires itself up either way. And then lo and behold, what comes through this thing that looks like an exact replica of CERN is Loki. He comes out of there, Thor's brother. He comes rolling out of there, kills everybody, and then rolls on with this thing called the Tesseract. Man, I tried to get this out to, I'm like, when I saw this, it jumped right off the screen. I grabbed my wife and my son. I'm like, y'all have got to see this. I can't believe it. It's right here in a Hollywood movie. The first Avengers, like I said, within the first five minutes. So they fire this thing up and it's the, it looks exactly like CERN. And what does it bring forth? Something from another realm drops it in here and it's dreadful. Every time they fire up this CERN facility over in Switzerland, these people talk about apparitions walking around of these ghastly things that nobody's ever seen before. And these people are freaking out. Um, look at the CERN logo for crying out loud. It's all right there in our face. Like you talked before, I think about the Gothard tunnel, all these things that are unfolding, they do it right there in front of our eyes, but because they wrap it up in entertainment, we think, Oh, well, you know, is this revelation of the method? I mean, what is it? I, I don't know. I mean, it seems as if, the powers that shouldn't be got to tell us about this stuff before they actually break it down. And it, and it is funny that you bring up, oh, 2.3 trillion come up missing. And lo and behold, boom, 9-11 the very next day. How about that? It's crazy, bro. It is. The truth is stranger than fiction. I assure you of that. You know, this is this is the kind of information, though, that should make people turn off the entertainment side of life and understand that you could study the reality. like. I've, you and I have just, in the course of this, you know, 50 minutes, have shared so many different threads of a tapestry of truth that you can go down and investigate for yourself and understand there is a preponderance, an overwhelming preponderance of evidence about every portion of this topics that we have hit on tonight. And on any one of them, you can go and study for yourself and discover there is a world between the worlds here of the version of what normal men and women are going to be fed and given as their slave food in order to keep them with their bread and their circus entertained until they do their duty here on this earth and die like a cattle class. Okay. Information truly is the war that we now have the ability to search out for ourselves for one of the first time. Please understand this type of conversation that you and I are having could not take place in the same way, even 20, 30 years ago. But we now have the ability to communicate with each other and then study these things out for ourselves, find access to the information and then share it with others now like never before. And this is why I'm so passionate about trying to be an advocate for other whistleblowers to come forward because I understand secrecy 
is what they built their house on. The reason I was bringing those points up is because I must, I'm trying to explain to people the compartmentalization comes through secrecy and that compromise. And as long as people take those secrecy oaths and they swear against heaven and earth, like in the scriptures, if you want to hold yourself to a biblical standard, you're not supposed to ever swear by heaven and earth. You're never supposed to engage in that type of stuff. If you have, that's one of those big giant doors to evil, to death, to destruction, to the demonic, to have a right to come into your life and wreak havoc. When you have those oaths in your past and those things that you've sworn, those things literally become those burdens on your back that crush you. Like my secrecy clauses were part of the core tenets that kept me from being free. I witnessed similar things to what you just described. Like I've shared it publicly, man. In those tunnels underneath the London Bridge in Lake Havasu City, Arizona, there are literally places where these beings come up. I'm not talking about some kind of mystical creature. I'm talking about literal dragon-like creatures that speak the tongue of the Nahash. They come out and they literally are drawn out during these rituals and they come forward and speak like they are real beings. These are real this is the physical enemies that we are supposed to be waging this war with. Like I'm not talking about like some kind of ethereal thing here. I'm talking about the flesh and blood adversaries that we are actually fighting against. Because at the end of the day, when you want to list off the Soros is the Rothschild, when you want to list off the maybe tier four on a pyramid, a public pyramid, there are people behind those people who, and behind them is these physical agents of evil. They are wholly committed to an absolute malicious hatred of every man, woman, and child on this earth. They are only here to make war. That is it. They intend to, they, it says the dragon goes out with great wrath to go after those who guard the commandments of Yahuwah and keep the testimonies of Yeshua. He is looking for the people who are the resistance. That's it. Like you're talking about things like in movies where they put this information in front of your face. Satan is much better categorized as something like you see in Terminator, where he is like a, the one who can send things back in time to destroy his enemies because he knew some of you were going to be his worst nightmare later on in life. He understood that, and so he crippled you tortured you, traumatized you, stuck you in a place of suffering early on in your life to try to teach you never to fight back, to teach you that you'll never win. When understanding that you were always the more powerful opponent in the room, that you were always more capable than the others. For those of you that do have these testimonies, who have experienced these things like you've seen down there in the deep underground military bases, there's a lot of people who have experienced this. I just did a show with a couple other survivors brilliant people, one of which worked in military intelligence, and he himself was sharing that. And I mean, breaking down, devastated, humiliated in one side of it to try to describe the horrors of what he's seen down there, especially in Fort Meade. Like some of these places, this is all they've been doing from the beginning, because a lot of the research that they say is illegal for them to do on the surface, human experimentation, they test us out with ideas of whether or not we're going to accept certain concepts like Dolly the sheep and the cloning agenda that was going place in the 90s. They put these stories out there to test the population whether or not we're going to accept that, whether or not we're going to accept hybrids being around and being among us. But ultimately, believe me, that is the agenda of why Marvel exists. That is the agenda that's truly financing the capturing of the imagination of generations to make them demand hybridization, that they will want augmentation, that they will embrace transhumanism, that they will become like gods. They can become their character from their video game series, that they will take that on and they will embrace it. And in doing so, they will transform from the image of God, the image of our creator they were made in, and they will become something else. And that process is where the soul of man, where the spirit of man becomes decimated, becomes ruined. And ultimately why I'm out here is I want people to know that they can come out of this no matter how horrific they've been in, no matter how, even if it was just a moment that they saw it, like you, you had these experiences that you never really share with other people because you almost don't know that anybody has a working framework to put this type right. of experiences in. But the truth is there's lots of people who have that. A lot of them just have been bound up in shame and embarrassment, fear of publicly being mocked maybe, 
that they don't want to come out and talk about it. But I really believe this is the season where there is a revelation of the truth. It is like a revelation of the B system on one side of it. We're allowed to come out and talk about these things. You're, you and I are still able to talk about this for as long as we can. And we have a duty to try to share as much as we can during that time. Good night, man. I can't believe we're 56 minutes into this and I haven't asked you a word about permaculture yet. Oh. Okay. Um, it's okay. Leave the permaculture there. We're talking all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, bro. Well, man, we're going to have to, Hey, are you down for coming back for a part three? Because we'll have to start it off with permaculture and then drift <laughs> into this other, and this other stuff, because, you know, I've had other guests on before that have talked about similar things, nowhere near to this extent that we're talking about in, um, you know, about the, the dreadful dark side of things. Now, in the Bible, it talks about men's hearts failing them for fear of what's coming upon the earth. Is that what you're talking about? I mean, these very, these, you know, people have laughed David Ike to scorn uh, for years now. And I think he was right. I mean, I really do think he was right regarding all that. And folks, if you don't know who I'm talking about, go check him out. Um, you know, I don't agree with everything he says or certainly not his secular point of view regarding a lot of this stuff, because I do believe as Nathan said a moment ago that this is uh this is a battle. I mean, think about it, y'all. If, if this isn't a battle between good and evil, then nothing makes sense. Then none of this stuff makes any sense whatsoever. And uh, I think you put it a beautiful way as far as um, the enemy's desire to, to break you down, to break all these people down, hoping that they stay in this cycle of depravity or, Maybe they willingly exchange their soul um, for fame or money or whatever these things are. You know, it, it's a it's a dreadful place, man. But when you look around us right now, it just seems as if I got to ask you. I mean, because I guess we're not going to get to the permaculture in this thing. I got to with all that you've been through, all that you've seen. I mean, it's my understanding that you've seen some things that would honestly shatter the teeth of most people had they ever seen such things. Um, Nathan, I'm looking around me right now in this earth, and it's getting tougher every day to fight this fight, I think, because I don't see the allies. I don't see anybody saying, oh, shoot, you're right. Those are chemtrails up there. That's not a contrail. You know, people are wanting to know who really killed Kennedy, but you can't even look up in the sky at these streaks that they're putting up there for who knows what reason. I think I got a I got a series of reasons I, I think they're doing it. And I don't see anybody waking up to drive know. on as you are putting you got a great YouTube channel. I was just watching it the other day when I found out you had one, and you're putting out fantastic information out there. You're obviously getting suppressed, and I'd love to know what those videos were about that they're suppressing. Um, what, what's your motivation, bro? Cause I don't see a whole lot of people waking up right now. You know, that's such a good question. And I do, I'll just, I'm going to read to you as you're describing what we're experiencing every single day. It's, it's wearying out here. You know, you, you stand on the wall. There's this requirement that, that I absolutely took to heart when I read the book of Ezekiel and it described a watchman who is standing on a wall. Like I understood what you pull guard duty. You understood what it's like to stand there. You're dog tired. You're exhausted. You did the full day. Everybody else did. And then you're going to go stay up and be up and be vigilant when everybody else can take rack out and sleep for a little while. Like being on guard is not a joke. Your life depends on it. And all the lives of all those that you're entrusted with depend on you being vigilant to persevere amidst those circumstances. And it says very clearly that if you see an army coming, that if you see an insurmountable force of evil coming your way, you are required to cry out. You're required to blow a shofar, blow a trumpet, to announce it, to warn them, to wake the camp, wake the assembly. And you know what? If you do so, their blood is not required of you. What they do with the warning you gave is not on you. But you are required if you stay silent, if you go along with everybody else to get along, because you know what? It would be a lot easier. I can find out what plays the YouTube algorithm games. I know 
what I could say in order to get popular and grow my channel. Mm -hmm. I know I could pay for the views. I know I could pay for marketing groups. I, I know I could do all of that. But you know what? I have dedicated myself to just seek to speak the truth, to trust that the Father can give me as little of a platform as I need or as big of a one as I need. Because at the end of the day, I am hunting the souls of men. I am not out here for any other reason. I am looking for the souls of warriors. They're called gibberim in the scriptures. They are the elite warriors. It says the mighty men of valor. Like when David fled, when he was persecuted and hunted down, he would said that all these men, 400 men came to him at the cave of Adullam, people who were dejected, that were on the run, who were in debt, and people who were disgruntled at life. That's who I'm looking for. I'm looking for the few among the many because at the end of the day, there is a narrow road ahead of them and I'm calling them to suffering. I'm not calling them to an easier version of life. It sucks. It says as wisdom increases, so too does sorrow. As knowledge increases, so too does sorrow. Mm -hmm. Bro, I have wept more in my life since coming to learn these truths than I ever did in the quiet conveniences of comfortability that I had before. It's devastating to realize that you are in a prison colony and that the entire system of who is supposed to be our guardians, who is supposed to be the helpers, the protectors, the child guardians of our culture are literally responsible for feeding the beast. That is a devastating reality. That's just one tiny paradigm slice of what the problem is that's out there. When you look up at the sky, when you look down in your drinking water, when you look into your food, when you look into your clothing, when you look into the very tools that you use, everything is stacked against us in such an overwhelming demonstrative way that it shows to me there is a fruit of a different kingdom that I am in. I was born into a different kingdom. Mine, very clearly, I understood what I was born into. I understood what radical, intelligent evil looked like. I looked into the souls of men as they were dying. I knew their last thoughts, their last utterances. These are words that are always in my mind. I never lose sight of what their faces of death are. I know at the end of it, life can happen and be wonderful and it can be brutal, but you know what? It can come to an end instantly, instantly. There was days when I woke up knowing somebody else who did not know me that it was their last day on this earth. Everything they'd done on it was over that day. That's an absolute imminent reality for all of us. And so I am out here because people need to know that it's worth it. It's worth it to know the truth and to grieve and to groan over it because it said even Lot was rescued out of Sodom and Gomorrah, a place of absolute abominations, horrific, way worse than just men wanting to have sex with other men. There was angel people trying to mingle with the genetics again there. They were going after strange flesh, like it says in the book of Jude. They were. They were splitting the seeds. They were doing the types of genetic alteration experiments that are going on. Like my wife today, dude, she came in. She was looking at one of these a product for her hair. And she she like had ordered it and then felt really convicted in her spirit, felt funky about it. And like, you know, ladies have way better antenna array to the spiritual mm -hmm. realm. I'll just say that. Or like my wife is my over the horizon radar system, man. She is on point, son. She may not know what it is, but boy, she knows something's off there. And she was feeling funky. So she started looking in and this product, they're like, oh, it's certified organic. It's vegan. It's all these things, right? It's all natural. And they're like, oh, okay. So she goes onto their websites and starts clicking the links and going deeper and deeper, and deeper into what these products really are. And one of these ingredients, that's their trademark thing. They're like super weapon, right? She had to go through like six different websites to finally find out what it actually is and finally they tell you they're like yeah it's genetically spliced dna between a wasp and a spider that's grown inside of a bacteria of a yeast plant of a yeast that is then being used to create this all natural product for your hair that it can help to like penetrate into your hair but it's totally like genetically grown spider silk wow. with that's altered stuff this is like the fallen angels came and taught men how to split species to do transgenetics and yet this is in some basic beauty product this is just one little tiny iota of all the things whether they're the food additives if any of you have ever looked in your food additives we do we are in an absolute war on every front and so we do men like you have a duty to stand here and shout the alarm as much as we can and then not just leave people with the horrible, devastating news that, yes, this is the type of evil that's taking place, but then point them 
to the deliverance. Point them to the authentic. Point them to how to get it. It's through a lot of hard work. It's through a very difficult road, but you know what? It's a more satisfying one. And this is like in the book of 2 Timothy. I'm just going to read this real quick. It says, but know this, that in the last days, hard times shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of silver, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence but denying its power, and turn away from these. For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women, loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. As Janus and Jambre opposed Moshe, so do these also oppose the truth. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief, but they shall not go on further. For their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of those men became. But you did closely follow my teachings, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the persecutions, the sufferings, which came to me at Antioch and Iconium and at Lustra, which persecutions I bore. Yet out of all of them, the master delivered me. And indeed, all those wishing to live reverently in Messiah, Yeshua, shall be persecuted. When he's talking about Janus and Jambri, he's talking about the black magicians that opposed Moses. Mm -hmm. These are people that were initiates in the dark arts. And you know what? They were found failures at their end. They had a job from the enemy to resist Moses. And you know what? The finger of Elohim proved them to be counterfeits. And at the end of the day, these people will be exposed. They will be laid bare. It says everything they've done in secret is going to be brought to the light. Everything they've whispered in their secret chambers is going to be shouted from the rooftops. And so it's an absolute inevitability. I picked the winning team. At the end of the day, you have picked the winning team. That's why we keep going. Even if it's just for one, we have a duty to stand here and intercede on their behalf and hold up a shield for them and have and call out to them that they can find hope and satisfaction. That's what I'm talking about, y'all. So you got to go check out Nathan Reynolds, y'all. Um, man, hey, I'm by the way, Nathan, I'm really digging your YouTube. Uh, besides that, tell everybody where they can find you. And uh, will you agree to come back for a part three where we actually start with permaculture? You bet, man. We can we can also just not hit the permaculture for a while. I could this stuff's fascinating. I love talking to you, man. This is this is fantastic. Um, yes, they can find me at snatchedfromtheflames.com. Some of those banned videos that that YouTube did not like so much. They're on there as well. And uh they can go to Rumble at the Linen Railroad and TikTok at Snatched from the Flames. Um, man, I so appreciate you coming on doing this with you, bro. Seriously, I feel like a kindred soul with you, man. You've you've been You've been doing your diligence in the research column of life, and I'm glad that you're speaking out. People are hungry to hear this stuff, and they need it right now more than ever. Well, it's a joy to be able to talk about this stuff. I mean, typically, we talk about permaculture, preparedness, practical living, and now the paranormal. So, uh, <laughs> we've, I mean, we've covered a lot of different areas here, but I think, believe it or not, I have a hook that leads us right back into permaculture and I can't wait until we get it into the next round. So, folks, go check out Nathan Reynolds. Give him your support. Go buy his book. I bought it the other day. You don't know it, Nathan, but you just autographed one. This probably on the way to me sometime. I, in fact, I ordered it after our last interview. So, um, you know, it's one thing to sit here and listen. And you, you got this free audio book that is fantastic. I I mean, it's beautifully narrated uh, despite the the content you know some of the rough content that's hard to take but you know it's really hard you know this internet could go away tomorrow so it's pretty cool to have a book but it's also cool to support somebody who's out there really trying to shine a light on this stuff y'all uh so please give him your support till next time y'all stay alert stay alive <laughs>